Welcome back from lunch. Our next speaker is a longtime maker of electronic gizmos and robot boats. Naturally, he also builds rockets and may or may have not had something to do with the flappy bits on the last commercial, uh, commercial jet you flew on. In this talk, he'll explain how sailing works, how he automated it, and his insight into the technology development process. Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Pierce Nichols. Hi, folks. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to teach a robot to sail. And uh, I'm going to also do that in context of the company I founded uh, to teach robots to sail. Um, and basically, our, our whole goal is to build automated cargo ships powered by the wind and sun. Um, and the reason to do that is because cargo ships emit a lot of greenhouse gases, a lot of other pollutants, uh, and something like half of their uh, operating budget is spent on fuel. So that's a good reason to go um, you know, build a robot sailboat. So, so that's you know, all the uh, environmental things. Uh, automation means that we don't need huge crews like sailing ships of old, and it all works pretty well. Um, gotten support from the National Science Foundation uh, through something called America's Seed Fund Program. Uh, if you come and ask me about that after the talk, I will give you an unvarnished uh, view of uh, what that was like for us uh, going through that. And that also unlocked a little bit of VC uh, so that we had some money to do it. Uh, it's not just me. I have uh, two co-founders, Jeremy and Dylan, who are not here. Uh, myself, I I uh, was flight controls engineer at Boeing for about 11 years. Uh, before that, I helped start a rocket company. Um, and I actually grew up sailing, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, Jeremy's our electrical guy. He's, uh, uh, most of his career is building robots to build airplanes uh, for a company that actually just got bought by Airbus. And uh, our third co-founder, Dylan, is more the mechanical guy, and he's done a lot of uh, agricultural robotics and things like that. As for me, I grew up on this ship. Um, my parents, when I was a kid, ran a sail training and uh, research outfit on the East Coast, so we sailed up and down the East Coast bothering humpback whales. Um, so, you know, I always thought, even when I was a kid, that, uh, well, the wind, you know, you don't have to pay for the wind. You know, why, why aren't we still doing that, <laughs> right? So, when I got older, I learned a little bit about why, and I'll talk about it. Uh, that in a little bit. But first, the prehistory of how uh, we, my team got together and how we got to uh, the point of wanting to teach robots to sail. So it started with uh, one of those late night hackerspace conversations, which was, wouldn't it be cool to sail a robot boat around the world? Which at that point, nobody had done. Um, and, you know, we just talked about it for several years without actually doing anything. And then we got kind of bored a bit about just talking about it. Um, and we started building some actual physical robot boats. Not this one. This one so, comes somewhat later in the story. Uh, we looked at data collection, um, which is an interesting market. And uh, actually, I will say that due to one of the conversations I've had here, it just became a lot more interesting than I thought it was last week. Uh, and I'll probably talk about that way too much if you come and ask me. Um, something else we looked at was there are a lot of marine reserves. And marine reserves tend to be remote. And they tend to be big. And therefore, they're very expensive to patrol. And a lot of them belong to very poor countries. So that's sort of an ideal thing for a robot sailboat. On the other hand, neither me nor any of my, uh, my co-founders have, uh, have the kind of network or the kind of temperament to sell into that kind of market. But, but it is where we got our name. Uh, Laid on is the name of the uh, hundred-eyed serpent that guards the uh, uh, golden apples of the Hesperides. Uh, so, you know, a marine serpent that guards something very valuable. Uh, while we were talking to uh, people about some of these early ideas, we had someone come up to us at actually Maker Fair 2016, shows you how long that I've been fiddling with this, and said, hey, if you build this, could you carry a few hundred pounds of, I think it was medical supplies, out to Kiribati, which is an island way, way out in the South Pacific. Uh, you know, the, the usual stuff gets, the way stuff gets there is on a very small ship um, 
carrying it 2,000 miles from Hawaii, uh, which is, you might imagine is very expensive. Um, and so we started really thinking about cargo as the right market because the cargo market is huge. Um, there's a lot of players. There's a lot of different little facets to it. Um, and then, you know, we saw that NSF, uh, America Seed Fund, might actually give us some money, um, which they eventually did. So if you look, so the even farther back prehistory here is all sea cargo used to move under sail. Um, at some point, we stopped doing that. Uh, and it's not because it was the ships were slow. Uh, that last generation of uh, big sailing cargo ships built, you know, about 1890 to 1926. Um, many of them were just as fast as a modern container ship when they had good wind. Um, and several of them are still sailing, uh, including uh, the ship here, Kruzenstern, which is in fact the last uh, long haul sailing freighter ever built. Or so far, we're gonna change that. Um, but their problem was that they didn't have good weather data. You know, nobody did in 1926. Um, they also required a lot more labor per ton mile than co uh, contemporary steam powered vessels. And after World War I, labor got a lot more expensive. So they were doing great up till about 1914. And uh, after that, um, they were kept in business by the fact that if you wanted to be a merchant marine officer uh, in Scandinavia or Germany, you had to have sea time under sail, which meant that there was a constant supply of cadets who were willing to put up with terrible wages and terrible conditions to get that uh, sea time. So now I've talked about that. Let me talk about how sailing works in the first place. Um, the first sails that we have archeological evidence of are basically pure drag devices, right? It's like putting your hand out, uh, out of the car window, right? The wind blows, it produces force. And that, well, you can sail downwind. If you wanna go upwind, you have to row. Um, that's not great. Um, more advanced sails, like the crab claws uh, up on top on the Hawaiian voyaging canoe, or, or the gaff uh, schooner, they form airfoils, like the wing of an airplane. And that means that you can produce force at right angles to the direction of the wind. And that uh, lets you sail perpendicular to the wind, and it lets you sail, to a certain extent, upwind, which means that suddenly you can do some, um, something much more useful. So when we, you know, people who know how to sail talk about this, they talk about the different points of sail. Um, if your ship is pointed directly into the wind, well, you're probably not, do, you're not doing anything useful, um, and you can get stuck there. It's called being in irons, uh, which is <laughs> pretty descriptive of how it feels at the time. Um, then if you're close to, you know, as bad as far up wind as you can sail, so that's close hauled, um, and then beam reach, Sailing vessels are fastest on beam reach, and then broad reach, you're sort of turning more away from the wind, and then a run is if the wind's behind you and you're sailing directly downwind. Um, this chart here is what's called a polar, and you can see the distance from the center is how fast you can go with uh, that much wind and at that angle to the wind. So as you can see, the, the uh, speed is highest uh, on a broad reach or beam reach, and then obviously can't sail directly upwind and downwind since the wind is coming from behind you. Every extra increment of speed means one less increment of uh, wind pushing on you. So you slow down a little bit. So what the uh, aerodynamic forces look like is now the forces for the aerodynamic forces are just a product of the speed of the air passing over your sails, right? And it's not the true wind speed, like if you're standing on the ground, what you feel is the true wind speed. Um, when your boat is moving, your boat velocity gets uh, subtracted from the true wind, and it's a vector subtraction. So if you're sailing upwind, um, your apparent wind, your wind across the deck, if you're standing on the deck of your boat, is actually a little higher than if you were um, standing on the ground. And likewise, if you're 
uh, if you're growing downwind, the wind across the deck's a little less. Um, now, as you might imagine, from, uh, you know, from this airfoil, you get a drag force, which is in whichever wind the way the wind is pointing, and you get a lift force that's pushing perpendicular to that, right? Now, you sort of have to transform that a little bit, so part of that force is pushing the boat forward, and part of that boat is force is pushing the boat sideways. Now, you don't actually want to go sideways. You, you want to go forward. So you resist that with uh, some sort of lateral plane under the water, right? And the lateral plane is the rudder, the keel, and just the, the whole hull of the boat forms that, uh, that lateral plane lifting surface. Um, so you have some forces from the sail, you know, some resultant force from the sail, and you have another resultant force from all of everything that's going on underwater, you know, both lift and drag. And as long as the vector sum of those two forces points forward, you will sail forward. And that's basically how the physics work. But there's a little uh, fly in the ointment, which is that the center of effort of your sail is mm, somewhere, somewhere up above you, right? And the center of effort of all that lateral plane is under your feet. And they're pushing you in opposite directions, which tends to roll the boat over. <laughs> so uh, conventional, you know, single, uh, single hull vessel, you end up carrying a bunch of heavy ballast low in the boat to keep you upright. Um, since we want to haul cargo and uh, not big chunks of lead around, um, we went with a catamaran like this boat uh, that gets all of its stability from being really wide, right? And that's, that's all of the uh, restoring force to keep you upright. Now, and I did talk a little bit more about um, going upwind. So as I said, you, obviously you can't sail directly into the wind because then the forces don't sum to push you forward. Um, you, you have to sail at some angle. So if the place you want to get to is the direction from which the wind is blowing, you tack back and forth, right? And how fast you can do that um, from our modeling has a huge impact on how fast you can actually get to where you're going. So as you can see with this vessel, we have, uh, our wings are solid sail, our, you know, solid airfoils, like the wing of an airplane. Most sailboats you'll see instead have soft cloth sails. And the reason we went with wing sails, well, there are a bunch of reasons, but the most important one is they're a whole lot easier for a computer to control. Because a soft sail has a lot of sort of weird boundary conditions under which it stops behaving like a sail and starts damaging itself. So a hard wing sail has the advantage that it's always producing, it, its aerodynamic forces are much more consistent, which means if you're designing a, um, a control system, it's way easier to, uh, to do that. On the other hand, they're a little harder to, to put up and down. So this is our Pathfinder prototype that once we'd fully committed to, we're gonna do cargo and we wanna start developing that, what's the cheapest, smallest, saleable demonstrator that we can build, preferably without having to raise any money from anybody? And the result is this boat. It's all laser cut plywood, 3D printed bits, and stuff we sourced uh, from RC models. We started off with a, pro with a software stack called ArduPilot, um, and then we added, uh, after it didn't sail quite as well as we wanted, we added the trailing edge flaps, which you can see. Um, as you can see, they're a little bit more uh, hacked together than the wings themselves. Uh, and the other thing we did was the, the sail position is driven by a little servo at the bottom, and we cut out the position uh, feedback uh, pot out of the servos that we had, and we attached the wind vane in, in place of that. So you just send an uh, angle of attack command to the servo, and it maintains the angle of attack you, uh, you said 
uh, you set it to, which means that the sales trim themselves, which is a wonderful thing for making it easy, relatively easy to control. So we built this uh, in February 2021, and we got it in the water in April of 2021, and we sailed it around uh, Lake Washington and Green Lake uh, up in Seattle, where we're based, um, most of that summer uh, and into the winter of 2022. Um, you know, this, uh, and, you know, basically we're getting out on the water and sailing it every weekend. And, you know, it's not a fast boat because it's not a big boat. Um, but we had some real problems with Ardu Pilot. Um, the worst one was when we set it to go, fi to, to go sail to, like, to waypoints, like, you know, these four waypoints. Uh, it would sail to the first waypoint. It would turn towards the next waypoint, it sail for a little bit, and then it would completely lose its mind. And I found a lot of things that were not causing this. Uh, <laughs> but after a while, um, you know, this got very boring. Uh, oh, and also the capsize pro pro uh, pro protection in the sailing module in Ardu Pilot doesn't actually work. Uh, which you found out the hard way. So we rebuilt it uh, using PX4, which is, uh, PX4 is a much better software platform. The reason we didn't start with it was because no one had written a sail sailing module for it. But, you know, having modified the Ardu Pilot one, I felt pretty good about that. Uh, and that worked pretty well. Um, it has a modular software architecture like you can start and stop processes. It has a remote console. Um, it's better pretty much in every way. Uh, the other thing we did was uh, we found someone who had figured out how to make um, PX4 talk to the ground control software over a uh, uh, cell cellular modem with an AWS mirror, which has been probably the most trouble-free part of this boat. Um, we also put in a bigger battery and a power switch and other, other useful things like that. Um, this picture, by the way, is an older version of the electronics, and the electronics that are in it now have been revised. I think this is two revisions past that, uh, past that picture. So, talked about some of the history and about our boat. I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the algorithms for sailing. So, Big thing uh, is always gonna be steering. Um, and it turns out that if you have more than one sail, you can use them to steer. So we do that and that makes it much easier for the boat to tack. And also when the boat is going slowly, we get a lot more steerage authority out of the sails than we'd ever get out of the rudder. Um, and it's really simple. You just set the two sails to different angles of attack so that the, the vector sum of their forces now puts a torque on the boat, and that'll turn it. So I keep talking about tacking because it's really critical to how the boat actually works. The other big question is, so when are we gonna tack, right? The easiest way to do this is by cross-track error. So you, you have two, um, two waypoints, you draw a line between them, and then you measure how far you are away from that line. So you sail across till your cross-track error hits whatever the limit is, tack back and, and do that over and over again. Um, this is great for confined waters because it's really easy to verify that that, uh, that path doesn't include any rocks. Um, it's a little bit less efficient. Um, there's a better way to do it uh, in open water which is by continuously calculating what your, uh, your best velocity made good towards your, towards your destination is. Um, it requires that you have a really good sense of what you give up by tacking and how the boat's gonna perform. So now we're getting to the point um, in our development where uh, we actually got some money from National Science Foundation and from Deep Future and the first thing that we wanted to do was build a bigger boat. And the way, the way we decided to do that was 
buy a uh, Hobie 16 because there are a lot of cheap Hobie 16s around um, and do slightly unholy things to it. Uh, and we found someone who'd rent us some space. It really wasn't enough. It's about 400 square feet. Um, now, I, I went and bought the cheapest Hobie 16 I could find on Craigslist within a day's drive, which turned out to be about five hours away. So I buy this sketchy Hobie 16 that I'm not that young and the boat's older than I am. Um, yeah, the first, uh, first federal grant that I've ever been personally responsible for, it's the first thing I do. I take a stack of cash out of an ATM and go give it to uh, a sketchy dude in a muddy field in Oregon. <laughs> uh, the boat got home all right, and then it uh, lived in one of my co-founder's driveways for, uh, for a couple of months while we were searching for space. Uh, and you know, the space we got was maybe three miles from his house. The trailer, which had survived the pull up from Oregon, did not survive that. <laughs> um, luckily, I ha we had a chase car behind us. Um, and when the tongue broke and the front of the, and the bows of the, of the, the Hobie cat hit the pavement, she leaned on the horn and I looked behind me. Boat's not where it should be anymore stopped. Uh, luckily, um, and there are a couple of pictures of uh, the very nice people whose house we broke down in front of and let us pull it into their uh, driveway and like helped us with like tools and stuff to get it fixed just well enough to get it the last five blocks. That's how close we were <laughs> to the um, uh, to our space, where it promptly broke again. Um, now, what I should have done is gone and bought a brand new Hobie Cat trailer. What we did do was we went and bought a cheap, shitty uh, utility trailer from, uh, from Harbor Freight and then put the crossbars off the shitty trailer it came on onto that. But it's still on that trailer and it still works. So from there, we started bringing the subscale prototype together. Um, you can see it parked out in front of our old space. Um, and you know, it has three big electronics boxes on it. The orange one is uh, you know, where all the brains are. And then there's power distribution and a couple of really big batteries. Um, part of the reason that we went with the big batteries is so that we could give it auxiliary propulsion, which makes it much easier to operate it in practice. And then we took this whole thing, wings, uh, cloth covered at this point, um, boat and everything. And by this time, it was November or December of uh, 2022. So you know, we all put on our exposure suits to go chase it around Puget Sound. Um, now, if you look carefully, you can see that it looks very down by the stern um, to begin with. Uh, we, we ended up fixing that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what our software and hardware stack looks like. So main computer, Raspberry Pi, um, because frankly, we're kind of lazy. Uh, Pixhawk running uh, our modified version of PX4. Uh, 4G to Ethernet, uh, 4G to Wi-Fi and Ethernet router to actually, you know, talk to the rest of the world. A uh, nice SparkFun GPS module with external antenna. Um, a Daisy AIS receiver, which is actually a gift from the guy who designed it, uh, who is also here, and I don't see him, uh, Adrian, another, another Seattle person. Um, we went with a lab jack for all of our sort of GPIO analog and stuff. Um, typical RC receiver, uh, motor drivers from an uh, outfit called Roboclaw, serial relay drivers so we could do things like have an e-stop uh, loop that actually works, right? So there's big red buttons all over the outside of the boat that if you hit it with a, with a uh, boat hook, the boat will stop doing anything. Um, very important safety thing. Uh, a horn to say, we're about to start the props. So get your legs out of the way. 
And then we had Q ground control um, running on a very expensive tablet uh, that happens to be waterproof and have a screen so bright you can read it in full blazing sunlight. Um, and it costs more than most laptops as a result. Uh, then the sales are basically a smaller repeat of the same stuff. But then that meant we could sell it. Uh, and this middle picture is just my favorite picture of it. You could see the back of an, uh, the stern of another boat um, in there. And what happened was uh, the place this picture is taken from is on top of a big seawall uh, at the marina entrance. So our buddy who took this picture is standing up on the top of there, like gesticulating at us as we go out because he could see that, that other boat coming, but we couldn't. <laughs> so um, this picture was taken right, uh, right after I'd finished putting the helm all the way over and putting the um, auxiliary propulsion in reverse to make sure that we didn't hit that other boat <laughs> um, that I previously couldn't see. You'll see, you can notice that the boat's also um, sailing a lot flatter at this point. Um, it's trimmed a lot better than it was in the picture on the left. And that's because we bought a uh, raw water tank uh, from an RV store and <laughs> um, bungee tied it to the foredeck of one of the hulls. Uh, and that flattened out, it, you know, 20 gallon tank. Is just the right amount of weight and in just the right place to flatten the boat out. And the nice thing about it being a water tank is we just fill it with a, with a bilge pump uh, at the ramp. And then when we're done, we open the valve and we dump it out and we don't have to, to uh, haul it all around. So I also have some video of, uh, of this and I'm Yeah, so this is us sailing on a, you know, fairly, uh, fairly gentle day out in Puget Sound. Um, this was probably February or March. It was also the first test where we put, uh, put the solar panels on the wings. Um, and it actually turns out works pretty well because uh, even though the uh, alignment is uh, less than stellar because they're vertical, um, they're also in the middle of a huge light reflector, in, uh, na namely the, all the water it's floating in, which means that they perform a little bit better than you might expect if you just uh, calculated the direct angle. And uh, to, to keep the Coast Guard off our, our back, of course, we're chasing along after it in, a, in my Zodiac. Uh, I'm still wearing my hard hat in this picture, but not everyone is. Uh, mostly we just stayed far enough away so that even if it flipped over, it wouldn't hit us, um, which, is, which is what the hard hats are for. Uh, we're actually a lot farther from the boat than, is, than it looks like here because this was taken from shore with a long, long lens. So while we were doing this, we also put together some actual simulation uh, with gazebo. And it, you know, we were able to uh, reproduce our actual uh, sailing tests in uh, simulation. So we think we get, got it pretty well dialed in and we can simulate longer voyages using it. Now, in the video, as you can tell, the wind wasn't that strong. Um, one nice thing is that uh, in March, the wind tends to get, uh, get a little stronger in the Puget Sound. Um, so that's when we started doing some, uh, some envelope expansion and discovered what was wrong with our boat mechanically. Uh, so a, uh, a Hobie Cat's uh, frame is held together with these 
uh, cast aluminum pieces at the corners. And they probably weren't a great casting in 1973 when they were new. And we made them worse by drilling big holes in them so we could put the, uh, uh, so we had somewhere to step the wings. Um, and that day, the wind was probably gusting about 15, 16 knots. Uh, and with the boat tied to the, um, uh, tied to the dock, uh, the resulting forces were enough to, to fracture both corner castings on the wing side. And you could see what the result looked like. Um, naturally, the next thing we did was just rebuild the, uh, the frame, except stronger and much, much stiffer. Uh, instead of the uh, original sort of extrusions for the cross beams, um, we have like two inch by six inch aluminum rectangular tube, which is uh, you know very strong. And then it's a little hard to see in this picture except by shadow, but there's a uh, there's stays across the center that uh, make it just wild, very very stiff. And we remounted the electronics um, a little bit better, I think, than they were originally mounted. And then you can see in the uh, in the corner up there what it what the uh, rig to to lift all of the uh, sails up uh, looks like. So I also have a bunch of refer reference books. Um, this is an ex if you are interested at all, you should take a picture. Um, I think the slides are going to end up online. Uh, if you're interested in sailing as an engineering thing, uh, I can't recommend C.A. Marchage's books enough. Uh, he was an aerospace, a Polish aerospace engineer who moved to England and did like, wind, like wind tunnel studies and all kinds of things, different sailing rigs. Um, and the rest of them are, uh, are books that uh, sort of opened up my ideas of what a sailing craft could be. And then I have links to at least the open source portions of our software. Um, the actual sailing software, eh, we kind of keep to ourselves for now. Um, then the various sort of hard, hardware pieces that we used. Uh, Pixhawk is a great little, uh, great little device. Solar panels, MPPT charger, the Roboclaw. Uh, Roboclaw and Labjack are really easy to use. Um, they're really super useful for this. Uh, Tom Spear is a guy who has uh, done a lot of research on wing sails. Um, we refer to his papers often, especially when we're arguing. Um, <laughs> and uh, Eric Sponberg has done a lot of stuff with self-supporting rigs. And the Amateur Yacht Research Society is basically a bunch of rich, mostly British, some American people who do weird things with sailboats. Um, it's my email, Mastodon handle, uh, both of those uh, somewhat responsive, depending. And uh, how much time? I think I have time for questions right now. Uh, I think in the red shirt. <laughs> With what? Uh, so putting the, the wings on one hull has less of an effect than you might think. Um, and the reason we're doing it that way is because our eventual target market is cargo. Um, putting the sails all on one hull gives us a clear deck for cargo handling. Uh, it also means that the sweep of the wing sails takes up about half as much deck space as it would if they were centered. So the wind vanes are connected on this one are connected directly to the servos. You know, there's there's no computer processing; it's just a direct analog connection. They are a little bit different because the the wing sail that is downwind is in the wake of the other one, right? Which means that if you set them both to the same angle of attack, um, when you say sailing upwind, um, the one in the the stern one will be at a different angle to the boat. Next. Sorry, 
I actually don't remember how heavy they, they are. They aren't, aren't bolted in, so afterwards, if you want to come up and, and feel it for yourself, that's, that's cool. Most of the weight is actually in the base. Um, so the, the two servos, the one that drives the flap and the one that drives the wing, are both um, as far down as it can go, and then all the bearings and everything um, are also low in the wing. In the back? What? Um, so the, the big reasons to have uh, larger numbers of sails um, is to reduce the physical size of each sail so it's easier to handle um, and also to provide redundancy. Um, you know, for, um, uh, for actual production vessels, we, t we, we tend to look at uh, some odd number of sails, like three or five. Because the nice thing about that is that you can put multiples of them down uh, and still have a balanced rig. Uh, point one. So our first vessel that we're uh, planning to put, cargo vessel that we're planning to put into service carries one or two containers and it's designed for rural feeder uh, routes in sort of archipelago and archipelago-like markets. Uh, we're looking at rural Alaska uh, for that. And that's, you know, that's uh, shallow enough draft that you can take it up on a beach so you can serve customers who basically don't have any or very austere um, local conditions. But the technology uh, should scale up uh, from there. So we're thinking of scaling pretty quickly from that to something that carries one or two hundred containers, and then from there the, to something that carries thousands. Uh, so we expect the optimum for at least up to a couple of hundred containers uh, to look like this with a different number of wings, right? Because um, for an operational one, it turns out three or five or better. Because with this one, if we say lose a wing for some reason, we have to take the other one down because the, the boat would be completely unbalanced, right? Whereas if we have three, if we lose any one, there's still a balanced configuration, right? Uh, when we're talking, also when we're talking about a cargo vessel, um, Speed is not the only optimization variable. Uh, you know, for us, we, we want to somewhat match uh, existing services we're competing with, because uh, then for the customers, you know, we look, like the, we look more or less like the thing they've always done, except cheaper and more responsive. Uh, red shirt. Sure. So we need to have auxiliary propulsion for uh, getting in and out of harbor anyways. Uh, and we need to be able to fold the sails down to the deck for safe operation. Um, so that means that uh, with a larger vessel that was thousands of containers, uh, that's probably a monohull for a variety of uh, structural and hydrodynamic reasons. And then it's just like any other ship going through the canal. Any other questions? I think I saw some hands up that I didn't call on yet. Maybe I already answered their questions. I mean ISO standard 40 foot, ISO standard containers. That, that's what all of our customers and support services already use. So um, I, I think, it, I, I will say something um, somewhat negative about some of the other uh, wind cargo projects that are, are currently in progress is some of them are not targeting containerized freight and I see that as a, as a problem for them going forward because like logistics is a global system and we have to be part of that system uh, and that means ISO containers.
Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, so ship avoidance when you're out in the middle of the ocean is actually really easy. Um, the other thing is, is that the way the regulations are right now, we're going to have to start with crews on board anyways. So we can be autonomous, you know, we build with the, and design with the assumption that we will eventually be autonomous, but the first one in the water has two people on it because that makes the Coast Guard happy and reduces our uh, regulatory and technical risk. Okay, so I'm at time. Uh, I will be around the rest of the day. Thank you all so much.